I'm Margaret Levy, and I am the director of CASBIS, the Center for Advanced Study in Behavioral Sciences, since CASBIS doesn't necessarily ring a bell for all of you. Um, and this is the second in our symposium series this year. There's still two more to come. So please look on our website and uh, think about coming to the next ones. Rachel Kleinfeld is the next. I think she's here. I saw her a minute ago. There she is. Um, and after that, we have one on work, the future of work and workers with Natasha Iskander and Lewis Hyman. Okay, it is a thrill to have Glenn Lowry here as a fellow. I can't tell you how eager I was when I saw that he had applied to come to CASBIS. Um, we briefly were colleagues at Brown when I was a senior fellow at the Watson School, um, where he still is affiliated. I have been a great admirer of Glenn's work for a very long time, um, which tells you how old both of us are. Uh, not that I could understand his more mathematical contributions. Ken Narrow could, but I could not. But I certainly responded to his research on racial inequality and to the notion of social capital, which I think we should recognize that Glenn really created that notion in its contemporary terminology. Putnam borrowed it from him. Um, Coleman borrowed it from him. But it's Glenn to whom we owe that very important concept. I have also followed his life with interest for some time as he struggled to find his path, often with glaring publicity to his embarrassment, and I suspect his family's at times. But I've watched Glenn as, un as he's been unwavering in his commitment to ending structural racism throughout all the ups and downs of his life and work. And he uses his powerful voice in social criticisms of paths he thinks are at best problematic as he engages in the long battle to do away with the disadvantages created and sustained by structural racism. And he's one of our heroes. I just want to put that on the table. And we're going to hear a bit of that powerful voice tonight. But first, a few facts about Glenn. He is the Merton B. Stoltz professor of the social sciences and professor of economics at Brown University. He holds a BA in mathematics from Northwestern University and a PhD in economics from MIT. At 35, he was the first black to receive tenure in the economics department at Harvard, which it was almost impossible for anybody to receive tenure in during that period. So he's a very distinguished economist. He has also taught at Boston, Northwestern University, and at the University of Michigan. As an academic economist, Glenn has published mainly in the areas of applied microeconomic theory, with an emphasis on the economics of race and inequality. He has been elected a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and of the Econ Econometric Society, as a member of the American Philosophical Society, Vice President of the American Economics Association, and President of the Eastern Economics Association. In 2005, he won the John von Neumann Award. He's a recipient, recipient of a Guggenheim Fellowship and a Carnegie Scholarship. He has given the prestigious Tanner Lectures on Human Values at Stanford, which some of you may have heard in 2007. The James A. Moffat 29 Lectures in Ethics at Princeton, and the W.E.B. Du Bois Lectures in African American Studies at Harvard. As a prominent social critic, writing mainly on the themes of racial inequality and social policy, and more recently on mass incarceration, in which his voice has added real fuel to uh, beginnings of transformations that I think most of us want to see, Lowry has published over 200 essays and reviews in journals of public affairs in the US and abroad. He is a member of the Council on Foreign Relations, a contributing editor at the Boston Review, and was for many years a contributing editor at the New Republic. Lowry's books include One by One, From the Inside Out, Essays and Reviews on Race and Responsibility in America, which was the 1995 winner of the American Book Award and the Christianity Today Award. 
The, he's also written The Anatomy of Racial Inequality for Harvard Press and Race, Incar Incarceration, and American Values for MIT. Glenn, I am delighted to welcome you to the stage. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, thanks so much for that introduction, Margaret. That was so sweet to hear. It really was. And I'm delighted to be able to give this talk and uh, honored, actually, to have been asked to do so. Not so many symposiums being given during my uh, fellowship year here, and I was asked to give one of them. So that's a big deal to me. Uh, thanks for coming out, people. It's a nice crowd. Uh, let me just uh, cut right to the chase here, because our time is limited. Uh, you can see my title here, Beyond Civil Rights, what's a self-respecting self -respecting black intellectual? Okay, so we got three things going on there, self-respect. We got the identity thing going, I'm black. And I like to think of myself as an intellectual. So what are my responsibilities? What am I supposed to do? I'm also old. I mean, I'm in my, well into my seventh decade. Okay. So I've, I've been around for a while and I've been watching my country grapple with fundamental issues around race and inequality, justice, civil rights, citizenship and inclusion, oppression, discrimination, racism, bias. I've been watching my nation grappling and I sometimes get the feeling that we're not getting off of square one. I know we're getting off of square one because square one was pretty bad, okay? I mean, I know that we are not still in the 1940s and 1950s, or even the 1960s for that matter. I understand that structures have changed, that laws have been enacted, that norms have evolved, relationships have developed, organizations have been formed, work is being done. The struggle goes on, I get it, the struggle goes on. And yet, and yet, sometimes I get the feeling we haven't even really gotten off of square one. It seems like we keep circling back to the same set of arguments and the same set of dilemmas and so on. So it's a little discouraging sometimes. And what's a guy to do? What's a fellow to do in the face of all of that? I mean, a number of possibilities present themselves. Get out of the race business and write about something else. <laughs> Let these people have it. They're going to be arguing until the cows come home. I'm not going to change anybody's mind, basically. Let's get into another line of work. Okay, that, that, believe me, that thought has occurred to me. That's one reason why I took up a position at the Watson Institute for International Studies at Brown University, because you get to see the rest of the world. And, you know, there's a lot, lot more going on in the world than America's perpetual dilemmas around race. But that just hasn't worked for me. I find myself coming back again and again and again to these same issues. So what, what's a guy to do? OK, so that's my problem. It's not your problem. But I want to make you aware of my problem and of some of my motivations. I'm struggling with that, especially this year, since, bless her heart, Margaret Levy and her peers saw fit to invite me to be a fellow here at this uh, center for the year. And my project, I couldn't believe they really thought it was worthy, uh, is a memoir. I'm trying to do a little bit of autobiographical reflection after, you know, 40 years in the academy and so on, growing up south side of Chicago, you know, becoming a mathematical economist and then evolving into a more of a kind of a social critic and public intellectual alongside my scientific work. Uh, time to step back and reflect on it and find myself reflecting too on this perpetual dilemma and on my sense of disquiet, what's a fellow to do? What's the right thing to do? So that's one of my questions here. Now let me see. Hey, it worked. Okay. I want to start with a tribute to my mentor, Thomas C. Schelling. I'm going to be brief. Uh, Tom has a lot to do with the fact that I'm standing here today. Uh, it was in the 1980s when I came to Harvard. And uh, Tom was uh, the most senior person in the faculty there who befriended me. And the friendship was personal as well as intellectual. And I learned a lot. And I just think, you know, Tom's in his 90s. He's not going to live forever. Neither am I. But might as well just take note of the fact that, and oh, by the way, he's white. You guys think I'm being mischievous, right? 
I had to call attention to the fact that my mentor and my dear friend and the man who befriended me when I came to Harvard and didn't think I had any friends and who taught me a lot that I didn't know about economics and also about life happens to be white. That's not a coincidence to my talk. That's not an arbitrary fact. To me, it's a very important fact. Okay? This is not social science now. If it's ethics, I'm not sure. Maybe it's even religion. I'm not sure. Spirituality or something like that. I can't imagine what life would be like if I circumscribed a set of people with whom I was prepared to have intimate relations to being those who had the same skin color as me. It's one of the reasons why I am not entirely happy with the tenor of contemporary discourse about the academy. That is today, today, right now. Protest and demands for change and whatnot. I get the idea that people are upset and that things are not quite right and that change is necessary. But the theory of it disturbs me. The theory of it seems to me a bit off. It overemphasizes identity, in my opinion. That's an opinion, OK? I've just stated it out front so you know where I'm coming from. But yeah, my friend Tom is white. And I want to just pay a little bit of tribute to him, my white friend. <laughs> OK, I'm messing with you guys now. Stop. I want to pay a little bit of tribute to my friend, my dear friend and mentor, Tom Schilling. Um, so I've already, in effect, touched on this second point here. My motivation is to consider my dilemma as an intellectual, as an African-American intellectual, in the face of what looks to me like a um, condition that's near permanent of the subordinate status of African-Americans within the larger US social structure. Uh, we can get into why that's so. I don't claim to have a, um, you know, my mouth is no prayer book about that. I have some ideas about it. I've written about that. But I think the fact of it, the fact of what looks like we're locking in here in the 21st century to an ongoing and seemingly permanent subordinate status of people who descend from African slaves and who are a member of our polity and of our society, that fact strikes me as the being of first order political and um, ethical significance, a great challenge to our democracy and one that I want to underscore. A little bit of data, this is not an empirical talk. I'm not an empirical social scientist, to be honest with you. I don't mind reading about what people have done with data. It's not the kind of thing that I do in my day-to-day -day practice, but I think some attention to the broad trends is uh, necessary. And then I want to do a deeper dive on incarceration. Um, I will reprise here, to some extent, lectures that I gave here at Stanford almost 10 years ago. Uh, Margaret mentioned the Tanner Lectures on Human Values, and I was invited. And I spoke on race, incarceration, and American values. And some of what I have to say, if there's anybody in this room who was here and present for my lecture almost 10 years ago, you may hear me say again. But not so much. But I just wanted to acknowledge that out front. And then a little bit of talk about theory. Margaret was kind enough. I mean, the prodigious political scientist Robert Putnam, the prodigious late sociologist James S. Coleman, uh, the uh, estimable uh, sociologist Alejandro Portes and others have been kind enough to notice that in my obscure 1976 PhD thesis, I did indeed coin the term social capital and develop the concept in a, in a coherent theoretical way for my project at that time, which I won't bore you with. But um, yeah, uh, I think it's certainly relevant here because my equation, my little theoretical formulation here, my stab at a bumper sticker account for why the persistence is premised on that equation, social capital intersected with racial segregation, gives us permanent, persistent racial inequality. By social capital, what I mean is, in the context of that formulation, the fact that people's ability to develop their own inherent gifts and to get the human investments necessary to enhance their productivity depends not only on their natural talents or on the prices and uh, supply and demand of the resources that they might acquire to develop themselves, but it depends also on their social connectivity because of externalities, because of social spillovers, because of the fact that in the networks of social organization, the human development process is enhanced in various ways. If the society is segmented along racial lines, that means opportunity is segmented along racial lines, quite apart from what might be going on in the market. Quite apart from whether or not employers and so on are discriminatory, 
They may be, but they needn't be, even if they're not. These informal, non-market mediated social interactions between individuals are also instrumental in, in fostering human development. And if we have a dynamic system, one that's going on over time, and in history we have had significant deprivation and exclusion and denial of opportunity, the ability to acquire financial resources, the ability to develop one's human potential and talents, families that are less effective at fostering their children's development because their own development had been impeded. If we have that kind of dynamic going on and people are connected across generations as well as across space, social space, by racial um, affiliation, then we have a circumstance in which historical inequality can get perpetuated indefinitely, notwithstanding the relaxation of the regime of exclusion. Parents, grandparents, and great-grandparents can have been excluded and having been excluded, they are less in, well endowed with some of these resources, being connected with people who may not any longer be explicitly excluded on the basis of their race, but whose human development is uh, uh, limited because of the social connectivity to people who themselves were not given full opportunity. That creates a kind of what they would call hysteresis, a kind of dynamic overhang, a kind of effect from the past onto the present. And, um, what I was interested in in my thesis uh, a lifetime ago was uh, formalizing that kind of insight and developing a dynamic model of inequality to see whether or not, even if you let it run for a very long time, the consequences of history would wash themselves out. And finding that if social segregation is severe enough along racial lines, those historical effects would not uh, uh, diminish uh, even as what we would say uh, even asymptotically, even as you let time go on indefinitely. So in any case, I wanted to, I want to touch on that if time permits. And I don't know if time is going to permit these errant political considerations that I'm gesturing at down here, uh, but uh, perhaps the Q&A uh, will permit them. I don't want anybody to get a false uh, impression. I say Obama was no king. I did use the past tense. I mean, I know he's going to be president for another few months. Uh, but we are at the end of the era of Obama. And in saying he was no king, I said king, I certainly don't mean him any disrespect, but I'll just tell you what my point is. My point there is uh, I can remember the excitement of 2008. I remember how people felt about us achieving a symbolic victory and electing an African American to the presidency. Um, and uh, if you like, I mean, if it's necessary, he's a good man and I'm for him, I have been for him. Uh, but it actually isn't a path to solving this deeply entrenched problem that I was talking about, and I think that needs to be stated explicitly. So that's what I'm up to. Okay, so uh, Schelling-esque. This is my friend Thomas Schelling. He had a big impact on me. The impact shows a little bit in this lecture, but it is, uh, you know, uh, it is discernible in every aspect of my intellectual life. Um, I'll just call attention to a few things about Tom. Uh, he is a game theorist and not a formalist at all. Tom didn't write down equations and it made you think sometimes if he really knew what he was talking about. And it turned out that almost invariably he did. It just wasn't the thing that you thought that he should be talking about. It was more interesting than the thing that you thought he should be talking about. You thought he should be talking about the asymptotic properties of some stochastic process or about the structural integrity of some system of you know, interrelationships. But he's actually talking about the way in which uh, games present themselves in almost every aspect of human life and how much insight one can get if one takes thinking strategically seriously and takes the empirical facts of particular aspects of life seriously. So I learned a lot about Tom. We read all these people. Canero's name is on the list. I'm uh, very happy that Canero was here with us. Uh, a uh, very distinguished economist, great man. Uh, and of course, I had read Canero before I met Tom in the 1980s, but not as thoroughly as I did after I met Tom. And some of those other names on the list will be familiar to you. Uh, Leo Strauss is an obscure uh, philosopher. There's a school called Straussian you know, philosophy that's named after him. But yeah, Tom drove me to Leo Strauss at one point. And I can tell you over drinks afterwards how that came to be. Uh, and we talked together and we taught about race, but not about race exclusively in the United States in the context of our own particular history, about race understood in the broadest possible way. This was something about Tom 
that I so much admired and from which I learned that some of these insights could be portable. You can do comparative study. You can learn about case A from looking at how the concepts relevant to case A work themselves out differently in cases B, C, and D. And so we did, you know, whether it was, as I say, Roma in Europe or untouchability or slave maroon communities in the Caribbean or uh, how the deaf uh, deal with their impairments or how it is that people try to change their identities in order to be more accepted and all the implications of that and uh, collective punishment and reputation and all these different things. It was just a wild ride and I got so much out of it. Um, and we explored lots of conceptual puzzles and um, very Schelling-esque, this list of things that we're talking about here with group think, dog whistle politics, naked emperors, you know, what is another person thinking about what I'm thinking about what they're thinking and all these kinds of, all these kinds of things. So I incurred an enormous intellectual debt to one Thomas C. Schelling. All right. Now, that was a preface and I wanna shift gears a bit. Uh, Brown versus Board of Education, a landmark Supreme Court case. Everybody knows what that was. The Supreme Court decides that separate but unequal is not consistent with the 14th Amendment of the US Constitution. It's a watershed case. It's meant to open up an era of equal opportunity. Uh, this book by Murdoch somewhat framed the discussion for quite a few decades after the Second World War about this problem of incorporating the descendants of slaves more fully into the body politic of the United States. America's dilemma, our ideas about ourselves not comporting with our practice and ex explicitly the social exclusion and subordination of African Americans being consistent with the ideals of equality of citizenship and American democracy. So there's a dilemma, what are we gonna do about it? There's also facts on the ground that are shifting. I call attention to the uh, liberalization of immigration laws in 1964 and the consequent uh, uh, demographic developments that have occurred where large numbers of non-European uh, persons who have come and joined the United States are part of our polity from Asia, from Africa, and from Latin America. And it comp uh, complicates, I think, Though I'm not prepared to say in a systematic and holistic way how so, I think it's something we could think about and talk about. Uh, it complicates uh, this uh, question of resolving the American uh, dilemma. So my bottom line here, I realize there's too much text on that slide. There are too much text on all of my slides. <laughs> okay, you do not have to try to read the text. I'm not a real good slide producer, okay? But uh, I'll just kind of, uh, uh, tell you what I what my punchline here is. It's it's really exhibited in these uh, last few bullet points. You know, okay. So how are we doing? Have we solved the problem? No, we haven't hardly solved the problem. We have made progress. Enormous progress has been made. You're supposed to say that. You have to say that is true. Uh, but we have enormous problems that remain, and I'm going to talk some about that. Um, but here's my speculation that I want to offer, and it's really uh, a proposal. I'm not adamant about this. I'm not sure I'm right. Uh, but I have this sense that there's a 20th century model that is uh, outmoded and in need of a 21st century revision about how we want to think about this problem of African-American exclusion. Okay? And crudely, I'm referring to bias as the 20th century notion. And please, social psychologists in the room, I see you. <laughs> Don't get mad at me. I've been, I've been reading you. I know that bias is real, implicit, and all that good stuff. I'm, I'm for it. I'm, I mean, let's teach me some more about that. I really want to know about that. But I'm really talking about framing. I'm, I'm talking about the way in which you kind of conceptualize the overall problem, okay? And at mid 20th century, there could be no doubt. No blacks need apply. Can't live in this neighborhood. Can't get this mortgage. Can't get this loan. Can't get into this school. Can't marry this girl. I mean, there were definite barriers, okay? And they were real and they were based on bias, okay? I'm not saying there's no bias over there, you guys. <laughs> I'm saying it ain't like that, okay? And I'm saying, do I wanna hang my entire conceptualizing of the disparities? And the disparities are enormous and they present themselves in many different arenas around that notion. Or do I wanna modify or extend that notion in some way and so I'm proposing something here, and like I say, I'm not sure I'm right, okay? 
but a broadening of the conceptual lens of how we think about the disadvantaged position of African Americans to admit of the possibility that dealing with the lack of the full development of human potential in that population, which well may be traceable in some historic argument to biases of one sort or another, and need not be understood to be a reflection of the intrinsic inadequacies, inadequacies of the genetic or biological deficiencies or the cultural, uh, you know, uh, problematic cultural uh, characteristics of this population, but nevertheless are real, these developmental deficits. I'm talking about young men who don't know how to read. 18 years old, they don't know how to read. I'm talking about kids who come to school who haven't been parented. And so we're not responsive to the teachers in ways that admit of discipline and other things that we could talk about. I'm talking about, yeah, mass incarceration, and we're going to get to it, believe me, is massive, and it's incarceration, and it's unjust, in my judgment, as an institution, in the way in which we practice it. But heck, how many guys are out there at 2 o'clock in the morning breaking the law? Okay? I mean, it's not as if the incarceration is the consequence of a random visitation by security officers to people's houses. Situations develop in which people's behavior is also implicated. A 21st century model on this uh, gesture toward an account. It's not an account by any means. It's only meant to be a suggestion of how we might want to revise our thinking. Would not do away with bias, but it would open itself to a candid acknowledgement of developmental deficits that need to be addressed. And by the way, addressing them might best be done through a kind of expansive, progressive social policy regime that is justifiable on its own account, regardless of the impact that it has on racial disparity. I'm saying, if universal early childhood education is a good idea, and I think it well might be, we don't have it. It would mean changing our political priorities. It would cost something. But it well might make us a better country. And at the same time, it would help to address some of the developmental deficits that manifest themselves in the disadvantaged African American populations and that are reflected in some of these statistics that I'm going to show you. So this is part of my unease with some of the tenor of our time and kind of this discourse because, I mean, basically what I'm going to tell you is I don't think there's any way to get from here to there without persuading a majority of Americans to change our basic institutions that support human development in a progressive direction. And I don't think you can do that with 10 or 12 or 14 or 20 percent of the population. I think you need to frame your argument in a way that opens it to uh, a much more expansive uh, set of beneficiaries and that justifies itself uh, in terms of universal principles that are uh, applicable to all Americans. In saying this, I hope to avoid the, uh, the dead end, the cul-de-sac of, oh, are you saying all lives matter and not black lives matter? I was hoping, I was really hoping to avoid that. Because I'm actually saying both. But I'm saying when you're trying to actually change the policies of the state, the all lives matter spirit will get you a lot further. Okay. We can get into tactics, we can talk about particular incidents, we can, you know, we can go to anecdotes and whatnot like that. And I'm not against the young people who are trying to bring our attention to, uh, uh, to injustices. But I'm just trying to think about what the long run political game should be. Okay, so that's, uh, that's, uh, that's my framework. Okay, so I'm gonna skip past that. I, this is basically me justifying that I can talk about race in the United States without being a parochial American-centric person, because the issue uh, has uh, legs. Uh, the, these concerns are not simply uh, parochial. And as I say, comparative study, some of these issues I'm finding to be quite uh, enlightening. And there are themes that are um, manifesting themselves in, in lots of different uh, situations in India, in South Africa, in uh, Latin America, uh, in Europe. Uh, here in the United States and North America, indigenous populations, Australia, I mean, we can go on. None of these cases are like any of the other cases, but uh, they are sitting in a kind of relationship to one another that I think one can learn about, about them. Uh, that's what I was trying to uh, get at there. And, and one of the things that uh, is a, uh, 
uh, is, a, is a commonplace in the study of, uh, of uh, divided societies and group inequality is this problem of uh, transition, uh, which I have alluded to in talking about social capital, of inter intergenerational justice, of grappling with the consequences of historical wrongful acts and so on. Okay, so I wanna talk about the facts for a little bit about racial inequality in American society. Um, and uh, we're basically not, uh, we're not there and it doesn't look like we're getting there. And again, I'm being a little bit flippant down here at the end. That's okay, because we got us a black president. Well, I'm happy we had us a black president, uh, but uh, that was not really okay uh, because we have us a black president. The question is, remains, uh, what's to be done? Uh, Okay, sorry, I'm pushing, okay, okay. So, quickly, all right, um, I've just uh, uh, pulled up a couple of uh, graphics here to try to illustrate uh, my, th my theme, which is that racial disparity in the U.S. is substantial in magnitude. It is showing no tendency toward convergence over time. So uh, I won't dwell on this, but here are just a few uh, graphs that capture this idea. Okay, so this is the household um, income of the median household uh, by race. These are not Hispanic persons, blacks and whites in the United States for four decades after 1968. And what you can see there is that there's a substantial disparity between the races and there's no tendency toward convergence. This is the 50th percentile of the households arrayed by their income. So half have more, half have less. If you like typical household, uh, blacks on average, uh, I should say at the median, uh, with, um, I don't know, 60% of the household resources available uh, to uh, white Americans. I'm not making any claim about the cause of that. I'm just pointing out the fact of it. Uh, these are poverty rates, percentage below the poverty line in the U.S., non-Hispanic blacks and whites. And you do see some uh, closing of the gap there over that long period, but still a very substantial Gap, and I think it's fair to say you don't read off that graph any tendency toward convergence in the near future to equality. Um, these are the earnings, wage and salary earnings, again, at the median, broken down by race and by uh, sex, black men and women over uh, the same period of time. And again, you can see what you can see there, uh, a gap between men and women, a gap between black and white men, uh, and no real tendency toward the convergence of that racial gap amongst men in the earnings of uh, the median um, worker. Um, these are the proportion who are homeowners by race over that same period. This is a very crude report about the um, asset holdings of uh, uh, black and white households over that same period. And again, as I say, you can see that there's no tendency toward convergence. So what you see when you look at these graphs just pictorially is there's a big gap and it seems to be persisting into the 21st century quite nicely in terms of the earnings, uh, uh, family income, and so on of, um, of black and white Americans. Uh, these are college going, college graduation rates um, amongst uh, black and white young adults uh, in that period from 1960 to 2005. And also you can see there a substantial gap. It's actually gotten wider over the period, no tendency toward convergence. So uh, we have a problem. And we have a problem in spades in terms of racial inequality if we turn our attention to uh, incarceration. And I wanna talk about that. And that's really what I'm gonna spend the rest of my time here in this lecture talking about as a special case in point, illustrating the general point that I'm making about the persistence of racial inequality. Okay, so let's call him Jamal. Okay. My point is that he's a man. He's a human being, he's a person. He's a lawbreaker, he's a drug dealer, he got caught with a weapon, he assaulted somebody, he robbed somebody, he stole, he broke in. Maybe he's a sexual offender. 
What are we to do with him? Who is he to us? Or if you like, who is he to me? Your African-American intellectual who wants to be self-respecting. Are his burdens and problems my burdens and problems? If Tom Schelling's being white didn't stop me from letting him mentor me, why should this guy being black particularly grab my attention as an African-American so that I become his defender? Who is he? Who is he to me? Who is he to you? Can we simply throw him onto the dung heap of human debris and be done with him? Does his transgression cancel out his humanity? Doesn't it tell us something profound about us, how we deal with him? At the end of the day, I want to argue, this whole thing is not about Jamal. It's about us. Every society has Jamals. No other society on the planet has the institutions of control over human beings that we have developed here in the United States of America. Nowhere. That's Jamal, and I found myself standing up for my brother here, even though he's probably a knucklehead. I'm thinking, I'm thinking he's probably done something. He's probably, you know, diminished the collective reputation of the race. I should be mad at him. How many baby mamas he got? Is he taking care of his kids, et cetera, et cetera? Did he really go looking for work, or is he just BSing? And yet I find myself speaking for Jamal. And if I don't, who will? What would it mean to be a self-respecting black intellectual who is indifferent to the plight of Jamal? So that's Jamal. Um, and again, I'm trying to reflect some of my motivation here in the talk. Uh, but I want to make a few points here about imprisonment, that we are an outlier compared to other countries and also compared to our own history, that inequality in the application of punishment by race and by class is, uh, is very, very substantial, that the war on drugs played a very uh, important role in uh, engendering this transformation of uh, institutions of punishment that we've observed. It's certainly not the only thing going on, but at least in terms of proximate cause, uh, and that these institutions of punishment should be thought of as an important component of our overall structure of institutions dealing with social policy. It's the way in which we are governing ourselves. It's the way in which we are caring for ourselves. It's related to employment and health care, especially mental health care and other things. Those are points that I want to make. Okay. Um, so... This is a little bit of uh, self-advertising. I mean, in addition to empathizing with Jamal and contemplating my navel, I've also actually gone to work on occasion and uh, tried to contribute uh, in my small way to the um, scholarly investigation of these issues. And I call attention to two pieces of work that I was a part of. One, a study group that was formed at the American Academy of Arts and Sciences uh, with uh, Bruce Western, the sociologist, and uh, we put out an issue of Daedalus uh, that collected some papers from a bunch of scholars who looked at these uh, issues around incarceration, race, and inequality from various angles. And then the other was a definitive, if I may say so, study that was uh, commissioned by the National Academy of Sciences National Research Council, which produced a report that has been widely discussed in the press on the causes and consequences of high rates of incarceration. And I'm going to return to that NAS uh, NRC report uh, later. Uh, there's the cover of the Daedalus issue, and there is the cover of the book that came out of the National Research Council's uh, uh, committee. So um, the United States is, uh, in, in a historical perspective, uh, radically at odds with what our practice had been over the course of the 20th century in terms of the scale of incarceration. And this little graphic here shows that you get this shift of regime at the end of the 1960s, beginning of the 1970s, that takes us off into a very new, um, a very new uh, set of policies. 
Uh, for much of the century, the incarceration rate had hovered at about one-tenth of one percent of the population, 100 in 100,000 persons. Uh, and uh, come the end of the 60s, early 70s, that rate begins to climb, and it climbs precipitately, and it's only recently uh, has it uh, maxed out and had begun to decline slightly. But still, as you can see, we're uh, incarcerating at a substantially higher rate than we had been at earlier points in American history. Likewise, if you compare the United States with, uh, in uh, 2012, 13, 700 uh, persons uh, uh, per 100,000 in the population under lock and key on a given day to uh, some of the other wealthy uh, democracies in Northern Europe, you see that we're an outlier in that context as well. Um, and finally, the point about race and class inequality is I owe Bruce Western credit for this graphic. I just uh, stole it from him. Um, uh, but what he does is he compares two cohorts by race and by educational achievement. The cohort born in 1945 to 49, that was my cohort actually. Uh, and uh, then I'm going to show you the cohort born, born uh, 75 to 79, and you'll see what the change has been over that 30 year period. But for now, you can just concentrate on the old geezers. And uh, what you've got here is uh, what proportion, what fraction of them will have experienced incarceration, by which he means at least a year, uh, not in a lockup, but in a, a state or federal penitentiary uh, by the age 35. What fraction of these populations will have done 1.4% of whites, 10.4% of blacks overall for this older cohort? That's a big number for the blacks, and the disparity there is, is large, as you can see, order of magnitude seven times greater or so. Um, but uh, uh, if you look at the difference within races by educational achievement, you can see that uh, uh, people uh, who did not uh, finish high school are much more likely, whether black or white, to be, uh, to be incarcerated. Um, so that was that old cohort. And this is uh, the number for the new cohort, that is the uh, people born 1975 to 79, um, who will have just turned 35 recently. Um, and uh, you can see that there's just a uh, huge uh, change in that 30-year uh, period in the experience of this uh, practice. 28% uh, of white dropouts born 75 to 79, according to Bruce Western, will have experienced a year or more in uh, prison before reaching the age of 35. That's a very large number. 68% of blacks who don't finish high school, according to Bruce Western. And I actually you know, said, man, this must be a typo, right? This, this is not the right number, right? He says, no, no, this is the right number. Um, we'll have experienced incarceration before the age of 35. So it becomes normative for that particular element of the population, racial minority, poor education. Most of the people will have experienced some time in prison. So, uh, it's, a, it's a big thing that we're doing. I mean, it, the impact, the footprint is huge, especially in the lives of disadvantaged people. Um, another way of seeing the racial disparity is in this graph where you can look at both the cumulative growth in the incarcerated persons. This is from 1980 to 2008. And also by the color coding, you can see the components of them. Unfortunately, the, oh, there it is, the legend. Uh, the proportions of them that belong to these uh, designations, black, white, and Hispanic. And anyone can see the graph there, um, the uh, proportion of blacks and Hispanics amongst those incarcerated uh, add up to greater than the proportion of whites amongst those incarcerated by the end of that uh, series. Um, I said the war on drugs was important, and it is. Uh, you have to be careful about how you handle these numbers because uh, these are incarceration rates by crime, but people are being sentenced to different lengths of stay in prison. so looking at a cross-section at a given date and looking at the proportion of people in there for that crime at that date might not tell me everything that I want to know. But in any case, what you can see there is that the uh, role of drug-related uh, incarcerations uh, in the uh, state imprisonment uh, complex uh, accelerated dramatically over the period between 1980 and 2000. Um, so a person could ask the question. Uh, you know, yeah, you got more punishment, but you all, perhaps it's because you have more crime. And uh, actually, 
it doesn't look like that's the case. It doesn't look like the fluctuations up and down in the crime rate, those open circles here. I take this graph from a paper by Stephen Levitt. Uh, those open circles are reporting um, a measure of the intensity of crime, the index crimes uh, frequency per 100,000 uh, in the population. And the uh, dark circles are measuring the incarceration rate, prisoners per 100,000. And uh, what you can see, there are different legends, of course. Um, what you can see is that while crime rates go up and down and had been falling very uh, in a sustained manner from the early 1990s, uh, the imprisonment rate, as you know, has just been rising and rising. That doesn't prove anything, but it does give a caution to the idea that what's going on in imprisonment is simply a response to fluctuating crime rates, because crime rates go up and down, but the imprisonment rate had just gone up. Um, and this is much remarked. Uh, Michelle Alexander makes an entire book out of this point in a way, the point that the incidence of the enforcement of drug laws is racially biased in the country. Her book, The New Jim Crow, she claims that the rise of mass incarceration is really the late 20th, early 21st century uh, reassertion of the same kind of uh, contempt for the humanity of African Americans that one saw in Jim Crow. And I, I think that's a debatable argument, but I, I'm okay with the spirit of it. I mean, she's trying to call our attention to an important set of social issues. I'm not gonna, you know, um, chastise her for not dotting every I or crossing every T or maybe even for a little bit of overstatement. Uh, I am not personally myself much given to these uh, grand, oh, this is like slavery kind of statements because, well, it's not exactly like slavery. Okay, slavery was slavery and that was a very particular thing. This is something else. Neither do I think is, mass incarceration like Jim Crow. I think those are entirely different categories as a matter of fact, but I see what she's getting at. It's a metaphor and I, I'm not gonna argue with it. But in any case, the point here is um, the, uh, there does seem to be bias in the enforcement of the drug laws. I mean, uh, this is just from one uh, report uh, uh, from the early aughts but uh, looking at uh, surveys of, uh, you know, these are self-reported responses by young people. Did you use drugs? Did you sell drugs? It looks like uh, blacks and whites are not so different. Maybe whites a little bit more uh, amongst young people, users and sellers of drugs. But uh, if you look at the uh, juveniles who are detained for drug offenses uh, in the same period, you see a very substantially higher rate of uh, juvenile detention for drug offenses amongst blacks. Uh, and this is uh, uh, Levine and Small put in a freedom of information request to the New York City Police Department and forced them to release the data on marijuana um, arrests in the city. And um, I just put it there because it's, I find it really quite striking that um, if you want to call it the Giuliani effect, I'm not sure. Uh, but in any case, you see in the 1990s a very, very substantial uh, increase in the frequency with which New York City police officers were detaining and arresting uh, uh, residents of the city for uh, marijuana possession. It clearly reflects a policy choice. Um, and then I would just want to observe, and this time is limited, so I'm gonna to have to make some judicial choices here about what I present to you. But I want to, I want to observe that, I, I, I want to try to make the case that we are punishing people for what they do, but in a way we're also punishing people for who they are, because what they do is not unrelated to who they are. I mean, who they are in terms of their social location, in terms of their education, in terms of their poverty, in terms of the <laughs> neighborhoods that they grew up in and so forth and so on. The people whom we're confining are a very disadvantaged population. That's what I wanna say. We're not punishing them because they're poor per se, but their poverty is not unrelated to the fact that they are, at the end of the day, uh, finding themselves uh, in that situation. And I say that because I wanna go on to try to make an argument here that there's a lot of responsibility to go around. Personal responsibility is important. Holding criminal offenders accountable for what they have done and affirming for the society as a whole the rightness and wrongness of ways of acting is not something that can just be seeded to the winds of political progressivism. We can't stop doing that. That's kind of an anchor of our 
civilization, if you'll let me use that word. I understand it's a provocative word, but, I, but I, I, I'm kind of feeling like, you know, a society in which we gave up on the idea of holding people accountable for their wrongful acts would not be a very pleasant place to live. On the other hand, that can't be the end of the moral discussion. It, it can't be that you construct institutions of the scale and the character that I've been illustrating here. You embed them in your society, and you see how they're affecting millions of people, and you sum up your moral discussion by saying, well, I've reviewed the sums, I've looked at every case, and it looks to me like they're more or less being decided rightly, and therefore, let the chips fall where they may. No, that can't quite be right. Don't we have social responsibilities as well? Aren't we collectively responsible for the conditions that may foster patterns of behavior that are that are uh, socially harmful, that we need to condemn. We need to condemn the behavior, but is that the end of our condemnation? Is that the end of our reflection? Have we nothing further to say about the matter? Uh, you have communities where uh, masses of poor people are basically shoveled into uh, reservations of public housing projects to keep them out of the uh, working class neighborhoods because they seem to be a menace. Okay? You disinvest. The, the economic activity in the metropolitan area decentralizes. Uh, the schools become considerably less effective at socializing and educating these young people to be able to be productive members of society. Work is hard to find. And of course, there's implicit bias. Um, I'm still just messing with you guys. <laughs> uh, so, so then, so then, then you find drug selling gangs going on. You find, uh, you find uh, uh, various other kinds of, uh, you know, socially disruptive activity breaking out. You find people who give up on school. You find uh, people who associate with their peers and decide that they're going to be thugs, that they're going to be bad actors, that they don't have any investment in the system. They glorify it, right? You don't have anything to do with that? I mean, you built the highways in the metropolitan area the way you built them. The factories located where they located. The investment went offshore when it went offshore. The unions wouldn't let the kid in to get a, a trade, whatever the story is, okay? And you see the mess that comes out of that, and you're done with it? You're putting it all on them? That's just them? What kind of social ethics is that? American social ethics, a person might answer. In any case, that's the kind of thing that I want to get at. Uh, and uh, if you had time to look carefully at this slide that has too much information on it, you would see that at, among state prisoners in this year, it's a bit, but uh, I had to take the data where I could find it. Uh, two thirds had a, a, a less than a high school degree. I'm looking at the ones that have uh, uh, high school graduate in uh, more than high school, that's going to be 33.4%. So that means 66.6% .6 didn't get a high school degree. Most of them don't have high school degrees. Uh, as you can see there, 43% uh, of them are black, 18% are Hispanic. Uh, they're young. The median age is 34. Median age at first arrest is 17. Median age where first engaged in criminal activity is 14. You see there that. 14% of them have asthma, 9.5% presented hepatitis. You see that 9.7% uh, had uh, exhibited some kind of uh, manic depression or bipolar. You see that 60% of them participated in drug or alcohol programs. You see that a quarter are diagnosed with some kind of mental health problem. An eighth have attempted suicide. It's a very disadvantaged population. The impact of what we're doing on the families involved and the communities involved is huge. Uh, this too I take from Bruce Western's work. This is a graph that's showing us the number of children, these are absolute numbers in hundreds of thousands measured on the vertical there, who have an incarcerated parent. Okay? That is 1.2 million African American children with an incarcerated parent at the end of that series, 2008. 1.2 million African American children, twice as many black children with an incarcerated parent as white children with an incarcerated parent, even though there's six or 6.5 times as many white people as black people in the country. So the uh, impact of the prison 
on social organization broadly is, is huge. Um, this is, I'm going to just go past that uh, to get to my point here. What does this say about the character of American democracy? Maybe not much at all. We're efficient at punishing lawbreakers, a person might say. I want to say it says something horrible about the character of American democracy. As a matter of fact, we don't value all of our people equally. As a matter of fact, we are prepared to consign some to the dung heap of human debris and be done with them. Not only because they're black, but I can't help but think that the fact that blacks are so vastly overrepresented amongst those who are disadvantaged in this way makes it a less salient and compelling issue on the agenda of reform for the country as a whole. Um, I owe this to uh, Sandy Schramm, the political scientist at Bryn Mawr. Um, I'm not vouching for the numbers, but uh, let's just say they're right. He starts in 1990 as uh, year zero, and he says, let's look at what's happened to incarceration over the period of the 90s, and let's look at what's happened to cash assistance receipts over the period of the 90s. Of course, welfare reform occurred somewhere in the middle there, and cash assistance uh, went down substantially. Uh, incarceration went up, as we know. Um, I don't want to read too much into that, but there it is. OK, so we did this study at the National Academy of Sciences to try to get our minds around what's going on here. Um, and uh, we came to some conclusions, and I want to state them briefly. And then I, th I guess I'm going to have to stop. I had prepared a statement. I had prepared a closing statement here. Uh, it's clearly not going to be time for that. Uh, let me see. Okay, so I'm going to have to stop. This is what you're telling me, Margaret. And like, okay. So I'm going to stop with the slides. I'm going to read the statement. This is not as seamless a presentation as I would like it to have been. <laughs> but uh, I'm running out of time here. All right, let's see how this goes. OK, so I'm shifting gears. I had been presenting data and making a kind of general argument. Now I want to make an impassioned plea. Okay? And I'll see how far I can get with this, because I don't think I can do the whole thing here. OK, so I want to close. Uh, with one scholar's personal reaction uh, to the historically unprecedented incarceration in the country, what are an intellectual's responsibilities given, given the sheer difficulty of persuasive causal inference on key questions of fact? Right, we're supposed to be scientists here, so we're supposed to know what's going on, and yet it's really, really hard sometimes to know what's going on, to know, for example, whether the application of the death penalty actually deters the committing of capital crimes as a causal matter? That's a thorny, thorny empirical inference question. Given conceptual problems like the limits of a purportedly objective cost-benefit analysis to inform public decision making, because I want to ask Stephen Levitt, amongst other people, how should we value a thug's well-being? I don't mean to single out Steve. He's a fine economist. But Sometimes when I hear him declaring that he knows that prison works because he's done a you know estimate and he knows how many you know crimes are deterred per dollar, I want to know what valuation did he place on the uh, well-being of the person who's being punished. They're also human beings. I mean, maybe it should be 0.7, maybe it should be 0.3, but let's make an argument for that. First, tell me what it is and make an argument for it before we conclude about what the uh, costs and benefits are. Given the incentives to conformity that stifle reflexive and critical thinking in the academy, everybody in this room knows what I'm talking about. I don't think I have to say anything more about that. Given that historical narratives are underdetermined by empirical research with the result that substantive political commitments can masquerade under the cover of supposedly neutral investigation. That is to say, we can look at the data and try to figure out what's been going on, let's say here, with respect to incarceration. But it doesn't pin down the narrative. More than one narrative of what has gone on is consistent with the same empirical observation. And so we're left with degrees of freedom that can get used to uh, further our implicit and unstated political commitments, I want to say. Given that uh, disciplinary compartmentalization limits the depths of academic conversations about these matters, we were even talking about this at lunch today, very few exchanges going on between the ethnographers and the econometricians. And given what uh, former Stanford sociologist Larry Bobo has called um, our American delusion, uh, that's the view that we now live in a post-racial society where any alluding to our racist past is irrelevant at best and evidence of disloyalty at worst. 
America's prison system has grown into a Leviathan that's unmatched in human history. That's actually not an exaggeration. I mean, it, it sounds like hyper hyperbole, but it's not. It's a description. Anyone professing to love liberty should be deeply troubled by this. That incarceration on a massive scale has become a central component of social policy in the country is a preeminent moral challenge to be faced, not merely a technical problem to be solved. We are not dealing here merely with policy analysis. The very nature of the country is at stake. And our integrity is on the line. America with great armies deployed under a figurative banner that reads freedom harbors the largest custodial infrastructure for the mass deprivation of liberty on the planet. For poorly educated black and Latino men, coercion is now the most salient feature of their encounters with the American state. More than mere law enforcement, more than locking up bad guys in the name of public safety, incarceration has become a modality of governance. It is social policy writ large, and no other nation on earth does it quite the way that we do. This is serious business. Punishment is rooted in violence. Prison institutionalizes the necessary, though problematic, violence undertaken by the state on behalf of its citizenry in the interest of order maintenance. Social control and the management of the unruly are the primary functions served by such institutions. But social affirmation, the construction of a virtuous we, is a less celebrated, though, though no less central function. And this violence is not only physical, there's also a violence of thought and conception, a violence of ideas, if you will. Key to this violence of ideas is the mystifying process by means of which the exercise of might on this scale and with this degree of inequality comes to seem natural, inevitable, necessary and just. Rather than becoming cheerleaders in this process, my view is that responsible policy intellectuals must strive to demystify, that is to lay bare the underlying ideological terrain. Okay, so I'm skipping through my statement to the conclusion. And thank you for your forbearance. Allow me to observe that the incarcerated and their families are not passive in their alienation. Rather, they construct meaningful worlds for themselves amidst the storm. They truck up to prison to visit a kid or a parent or a partner going through a rite of passage that is soon enough to become familiar. They bail someone out, knowing the money could be lost. To save their own hides, they turn their loved ones into the cops. Read Alice Goffman's book about uh, Philadelphia. They live with relatives who steal from them. They are one and the same persons and at the same time victims as well as perps. The political dichotomy of us versus them is morally fraught. Any given one of us falls, depending on the day or the hour of the day, to one side or the other of that divide. A biographic life can be lived to either side of the line, but the imagined life, having staggered back and forth across that line many times over its course, will still be seen in retrospect as unified in its righteousness and justified in its condemnations. I know what I'm talking about. In this regard, I know whereof I speak. As it happens, I have passed through the courtroom and the jailhouse on my way to this distinguished podium. I have sat in the visitor's room at a state prison. I have known personally and intimately men and women who live their entire lives with one foot to either side of the law. And in my mind's eye, I can envision Jamal, voiceless and despairing, perpetrator and victim alike, hoping that I might represent him on an occasion such as this. I know that these revelations may discredit me in some quarters. Some may assume that I'm siding with the thug and not with the victims of senseless violence. Truth be told, some might assume that whatever I might say, so deeply entrenched is this binary opposition in the American public mind, so I won't even bother to deny or to refute it. I am the eldest of two children, raised after an early divorce by a single mom. I grew up on the south side of Chicago in the 50s and 60s. Although the neighborhood was rough, my family was comfortable enough. My father retired as a high-level administrator with the Internal Revenue Service, and my mother a secretary with the Veterans Administration. I had cousins who went on to become doctors and lawyers. I also had relatives who died of a drug overdose or who spent years in prison. 
In his book, Code of the Streets, Ethnography, Elijah Anderson describes two broad categories of social orientation in the inner cities. Decent families who tend to be working poor rather than unemployed and who value self-reliance, hard work, education, church going, and law abidingness, and street families, according to Anderson. This is, of course, controversial, but you'll see that I'm just gesturing here. And street families. Um, who turned to lawlessness to make ends meet and violence to settle conflicts. My family had a little bit of both, sometimes in a single person. I'm thinking, for instance, about my uncle Mooney. He was a legitimate small businessman, a barber and a dry cleaner, but he sold marijuana out of the back of his barbershop. I'm thinking of my great aunts, Cammie and Rosetta, who fenced stolen goods as a regular course of events. They had young women who were shoplifting clothing and foodstuffs from retailers, who would get 20 cents on a dollar from my aunts. And my aunts then had big freezers in the basement so that whenever you wanted to have a family party, you knew that you didn't have to go to the market to get your ham or your turkey. You went to Aunt Cammie or Aunt Rosetta, you got a better price. They were church going ladies with the big hats. They were the salt of the earth, these people, but that's what they did. Racial identity was a primary factor in the Chicago of my youth. White flight had turned many of the city's neighborhoods into African-American enclaves, and the civil rights and black power movements had fired up black young people, me included. Even as my political approach to the race problem has veered sharply from left to right to center to left, back to center, I don't know where I'm going to come out. But even so, my foundational belief has remained consistent. Perhaps then you can understand why it is that I've spoken to you in such a manner today. Thank you. Thanks very much. I guess we have about 10 minutes for questions. OK. 10 minutes for questions, if anybody. And we have microphones around. Oh, right here. Talk into the microphone so they can hear you. Thank you so much. Um, I, I can't, I don't know if I want to use the word enjoy, um, but I, I feel like I've, t you know, had a, a t touched the wonderfulness of some of your work and your colleagues. I, but I am absolutely um, at a loss for what you were going to say about the replacement for the term, so the framing of racial bias. And so I, I'm hoping you'll take some of the time we have for questions to introduce what it, what it, is you have in mind as the next framework. OK. Uh, let me just respond briefly, since maybe we'll allow a couple of more questions. And there's a lot that could be said. I want to give an anecdote. And maybe I can convey what it, what it is that I'm talking about. And I'm not sure I have an answer for you. So the anecdote is about school discipline and suspensions and racial disparity in the incidence of school discipline and suspensions. My understanding is that the Office of Civil Rights in the US Department of Education is putting pressure on local school districts to where they have their statistics that are far out of line. Now, the theory behind doing so, I see a district where the uh, rate of suspension for blacks is much higher than for whites, is that there's either implicit or explicit bias in the practice of the black kids are doing stuff and they're getting suspended. White kids are doing the same thing and they're not getting suspended. And it may be true. I don't know. I haven't studied the problem carefully. But it may also not be true. It may be true that there are differences in the patterns of behavior between black and white students that have a lot to do with the fact of the nature of the home lives and economic circumstances and so on. Discipline, uh, paternal abandonment, mothers uh, overloaded in tax, poverty, and so forth and so on, so that the kids are mouthier and uh, less uh, restrained in the way in which they interact with teachers. I don't know. I don't know. These are, these are things that could be investigated. The default supposition that a higher rate of suspension for the black kids triggers an inquiry into the bias of the school district doesn't take on board the possibility that developmental disadvantages that are really going to hurt those kids, not only in that schoolroom, but throughout their lives, are not being addressed. That the nature of the social inequality is producing kids who are, for a variety of reasons, um, not exercising the kind of self-control, not able to behave in ways that are compatible with the uh, collective enterprise and so forth and so on. And that, if so, would need to be addressed. So people who formulate the school to pipe, this is all an anecdote, an extended anecdote meant to respond to you. People who formulate the school to pipeline metaphor 
there's definitely a reason to see a connection between what's going on in schools and the kids getting in, I meant to say the school to prison pipeline metaphor. Um, there, there definitely is something there in terms of connectivity. If they don't allow for the possibility that there are developmental deficits being manifested at that uh, front end of that thing, may not prescribe the right kind of interventions to actually counteract the problem, which is dealing, and it would take someone with greater expertise than me in uh, social psychology and family psychology and so forth with, the uh, behavioral manifestations of whatever background impediments that those kids might be bringing with them into the classroom. So to me, it's so 20th century to file a civil rights lawsuit having seen a statistical disparity and feeling progressively less adequate to the 21st century problem of a substantial minority of the African-American population suffering under one or another kind of developmental uh, limitation that, uh, that actually accounts for the, for the difference. This is not something one should talk about casually. These are serious matters, and there are data available for people to study them. I'm not an expert, but that illustrates the kind of thing I'm talking about. I want to corroborate what you're saying and, and, and point. The, the, I don't know if you remember, but there was a story in the New York Times about the little girl in the Brooklyn six-year-old kindergartner who couldn't control her emotions in kindergarten and got put on the got to go list at age six. And I'm just wondering if, Jam, if we had seen Jamal in kindergarten, would we have had a chance, we, the doctors, the educators, the whomever, to do something given that Jamal's emotional control system hadn't yet developed in the same way these little six-year-old girls. Is, is, that, is that a point where Jamal might have been helped? Um, I could say yes to that because it seems very commonsensical to say so. I actually don't know specifically how it is that one might help him, but I do want to take the occasion to say suspension may be a terrible way to respond to whatever these developmental issues are so that it's two different things. The disparity in suspension rates is evidence of discrimination or bias, which then needs to be punished under civil rights uh, uh, framework. That's one thing, and I'm questioning that. Another thing is, when I see behavioral problems manifesting themselves, is suspension the most effective way to deal with them in that setting? Might there not be other interventions or treatments that would be more effective? And that's something that I'm prepared to think, yes, probably so, but that I'm not expert enough to say exactly what those things would be. You had a, a slide earlier on saying that there was a, you had a negative adjective between the race versus class argument. Could you give us one minute on what that's all about? Yeah. What that's about is uh, Glenn Lowry thinking Bernie Sanders has whatever virtues and deficiencies that he might have, but being for working people and trying to uh, expand the social safety net and make the general character of social provision in the United States more decent and humane is a pro-black position. So that's me, and I don't expect everybody here to agree with me, grinding my ax, okay? My ax is we need to get to 51% to get something done, okay? My ax is there's nothing in the um, demand list of African Americans, whether it's about incarceration or it's about money for education or it's about social policy or it's about employment or whatever it is, that isn't also beneficial to working class white people. My argument is, I grant you police violence is a problem. I grant you unaccountable police behavior is a problem. It needs to be addressed. It's a problem that afflicts white people too, if we would bear to look. My ax is, I'm not interested in the race of the cop per se, okay? I'm very alarmed by this practice that we've slipped into now of white cop shoots black kid, okay? Where I fear that the next stage is, and it's already there on the right wing website, is black rapist rapes white woman. But what I mean to say is, what real significance was the race of these players playing in the concern that we had about their behavior? 
With respect to the cop, it was his behavior that was the matter. To mention his race is to presume that there's a racial motive. I don't know that that cop who shot Tamir Rice in that park in Cleveland in that tragic event would have behaved differently if Tamir Rice had been white. That's our speculation. I don't know how anybody knows that. Again. <laughs> we do know something about the way in which race ex ex uh, affects people's spontaneous reactions under various kinds of stimuli. I don't mean to be denying that that's true, but I'm saying when an incident like that occurs, to racialize it strikes me as a particular kind of political move that might not really be very helpful for solving the long run problem. Because I want to build a working class coalition that can actually prevail at the ballot box. And racializing all of these arguments to me is a way of, of not uh, being effective at doing that. Well, we started with Shelley like, I think we ought to give our hands a Lowry like. <laughs>